Our talk tonight is about moving into a bigger mind, <clears throat> more into the present moment. And in a way, that's about view. View has a very prominent position as the first step in the Eightfold Path. It's how we see things, how we perceive and understand them, and why we take the actions or behaviors that we do. These are all based on our view. If our view is closed and tight, we can't expand. So the question is, or what we'll be working with, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> is how we clear out our view. A lot of our view is, first of all, shaped by our conditioning what we learn from our original families. And that conditioning is so embedded in our unconscious that it's very hard to see and correct. Also, we have all this suffering on top of the conditioning, which is the thinking we often use to make sense of things. And that, along with our unskillful conditioning, seems to cram both the conditioning and <clears throat> the suffering and the unskillful thinking further into our unconscious, which makes it even more inaccessible. For example, when Venerable, Venerable Panavati was here, she related a story about how when she was 13, she went by train from her home to, in DC to visit her relatives in North Carolina. Venerable Panavati is now 74. So she was born in 1950. <clears throat> she was 13 in 1963, which isn't exactly the dark ages, except she has black skin. She got off the train in North Carolina, was greeted warmly by her relatives, went to their home, and that night, the KKK came to her relative's house looking for her because she had, they said, committed a crime. Her crime, it turned out, was that she was walking on the train platform and a white woman was walking in the opposite direction toward her and she didn't get off, Panavati didn't get off the train platform. Nobody did that in DC. She didn't know to do that. So this young girl was severely beaten, sent home by train the next morning. She'd had no idea she was supposed to do that. So it's so clear how her view was so different from the view of the KKK. Hang on a second here. <clears throat> we can look to the KKK members' conditioning and their own suffering to unpack how they arrived at their view. And don't we wish they'd done their own work and unpacked it for themselves so they could have had a different view? Whenever we understand something or see something like this, the most skillful thought is, how can I unpack my own conditioning and suffering? How can I tease it out of my own unconscious so I can see if it's helpful or not? So I can be a better person and a better person to others. It takes a lot of courage to unpack even some of this for a lot of reasons. There are issues of betrayal and loyalty <clears throat> and downright pain. It's easier to hide behind a hood and act out our anger. Easier to terrorize 
a young black girl. My father was fairly racist at the level of slurs rather than violence. His view was influenced more by his suffering with the, his conditioning of scarcity. He was an immigrant and never able to unpack his pain as it was too great and he didn't have skills. I could see his sadness. I sure felt badly for him and was very aware of how it impacted her, our relationship. James Baldwin said, I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hate against Negroes so stubbornly is because they sense once hate is gone, white people will be forced to deal with their own pain. Some good news, some very good news is we now have more skills, thanks to psychology, for working with our conditioning, suffering, and trauma. And if you combine good psychology with Buddhism, you can really go far. In part, Buddhism allows us to hang out with ourselves and wisely com contemplate to work with ourselves with kindness. Kind of an aside is that Julie Commissar, who's in our Sangha, is a social worker, and she just offered a session on trauma-informed resilience training to our Sangha leaders cohort, which is led by Mary Louise and Anna. So I've taken the next part of this talk from a book which is now 20 years old, <clears throat> titled Big Heart, Big Mind, by the Zen master, Dennis Gempo Merzel. So let's take a little stretch break. <clears throat> so it's common knowledge that as human beings, we are very complex. Venerable Panavati gave a humorous metaphor for this. She said at the sink, there's a faucet for the hot water, and then there's a faucet for the cold water, and they come together in one spigot. Except, of course, if you have a new kind of spigot that has, you know, you can flip back and forth for the hot and cold. But let's go with that image of the two faucets. And she said this had been so, what had been so amazing to her is that she could be so loving on one hand in one spigot and then so angry also you know, in the other faucet. And they had both come out the same spigot of her. So I'd say that as human beings, <clears throat> we have about 10,000 faucets or mind states. We can be happy, we can be sad, we can love, we can hate, we can be cheerful, we can be scornful, we got a million. And sometimes these are separate faucets. So Dennis Merzel, this guy, bases his book on a psychological model called Voice Dialogue, which was developed by Hal and Sidra Stone years ago. And I studied this technique with them years ago and worked with it when I worked as a psychotherapist and really came to love it. We are each such unique beings. It's just a pleasure to experience that. So 
So the way this voice dialogue works is that you or someone else, and this time it'll be me, I'll ask questions of some of these parts of yourself. It's like metaphorically turning on the faucet. You'll turn on the faucet and then listen yourself to what comes out. So you don't have to say it out loud, you can just listen. And you can do this often by yourself. And try not to judge it, just listen. And you'll get some information that you can work with. And if you don't get information this time, you'll probably get information the next time you do it. I often think of this process like fishing. You know, we wanna pull the fish. We wanna get the goods out of our unconscious. And so it's like pulling something out of the ocean to examine it, to see if it's helpful or not. And then when we decide, we can either throw it away or throw it back. Another metaphor is that we want to keep examining, updating, modifying, and integrating our hard drive. So this is a, an approach. This approach is, approach is like an experiment. And we can see if it's helpful. Dennis uses this technique to bring us to a wider and larger view. I chose the Naima Peniman poem because I love its wide view. I wonder if the sun debates dawn some mornings, not wanting to rise out of bed from under the down feathered horizon. If you look it up, Naima does a beautiful job of reading and acting this poem on YouTube. So let's begin. This is a little strange, so bear with me. I'm gonna ask to speak to a few of your mind states or faucets. And your job is to open that faucet and listen to what comes out. And you don't have to say your answers out loud. Just hang out a bit with what you get. This is more about questions for your own contemplation rather than answers. I love the last line of that poem, efforts give way to existence. That means to me, like, it's worth trying. It's worth trying new things. And helpful to do this as often as you want for yourself, so you can keep getting more information. And if you don't want to do this now, or it doesn't suit for you, or it's too weird, don't worry about it. We're just gonna do it for about five minutes. And any answers that come to you or any talk that comes to you is perfectly okay. There's no right answers. And it's like we're playing, we're experimenting. So let's settle in and I'm just gonna ask you about four mind states. So it'll just be off, you know, opening for faucets, as it were. So first, <clears throat> I'd like to talk to the part of yourself or the state of mind that is the controller the faucet, that's your controller. We all have a controller. It's really necessary 
We sure need our controller. It's a part of everyone. So controller, <clears throat> I know this talking to you like this in this room is a little strange, but please humor me and thank you for showing up. I just wanna ask you a few questions. I want to ask, what is your function as the controller? And you may get some information now. You may get, your controller may be shy. Don't worry about it. And controller, part of each of us, what would you like to control if you could? And you may have different answers at different times. It doesn't matter. It's all kind of grist for the mill. What is your greatest fear? as the controller. And if other parts of you took over like anger or fear or jealousy, how would you as the controller feel then? And let me just say, it's perfectly okay to want to feel in control. This is quite necessary, actually. So the second voice or part of yourself I'd like to speak with is the seeking mind. S-E-E-K, seeking mind. So seeking mind, part of you, Thanks for showing up. Thanks for talking to me. And what is your function? And what ultimately are you seeking for your person? And when you find some of the things they are seeking, what do you do? And seeking mind, when you climb a big mountain and get to the top, what do you look for then? So thank you, Seeking Mind. And I'd like to talk now to another part of yourself. I'd like to talk to Big Mind. So hello, Big Mind. Thank you for showing up. Now, Big Mind, <clears throat> How big are you? Are there any limits? Or boundaries?
Can you find a beginning or end? How would you express how big you are? And just think of this in your own words. And if you can't think of any, what might approach it? How big you are. If there's no beginning, and no end, what do you embrace as big and limitless mind? And the last voice, May I please speak with big heart? So big heart, as far as bigness goes, how do you compare to big mind? And if people were in touch with you, big heart, what could you offer the world? And big heart, what is the cause of the problems the world is in now. May I stay in touch more fully with myself. And continue to learn from all the parts of me. Tonight, we worked with those parts that like to control, seek the part that has a big mind, the part that has a big heart. May I be kind and generous and understanding to myself and others. May I wholeheartedly wish for myself and for all others health, happiness, safety, <clears throat> And may there be peace. May there be peace. Good night. Drive gently. <laughs> <laughs>